Well, think for a minute, Claudia. I don't... Uh... I mean, I can tell you there's nothing you can really ask because this isn't about a person knowing something. It's about an inward change. It's almost unknowable. And I don't know. It's very how you can work with that, but it's really hard to talk about it or even to ask questions about it. Zen practice, I've used it in talks quite often, so I think of it as a long curve or a straight line that turns into a curve and then returns home. But practice is about the first part. We think of ourselves as being uh, separate. I mean, that's what, why we have psychological problems. I mean, I'm me as opposed to you. And uh, if you don't act in a way that suits me, then I have problems, you see what I mean? You can't tell somebody what the clue is. The clue is to be uh, more free of that psychological self that's running you. And you can't tell somebody to be free, you know. It doesn't make any sense until you begin to sense it within yourself. And uh, So, with some people it takes two or three years. I, I've had people take 14 years. And then they finally get it, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> some people never get it. They're just not strong enough. Mm -hmm. You know, the sitting you're doing and all that is having a tremendous effect on your life, but it's not enough. I mean, anyone who works knows that the office situation is just a hotbed of politics, dissension, rivalry, uh, love affairs. This is, you know, it's, it's really fascinating. But people who sit sometimes haven't any idea what to do with that. And I didn't either until I began to sense how we had to approach sitting and our life all together. <laughs> I had a marriage and uh, had to get a divorce because of my husband's mental illness, which was severe and dangerous. And uh, was raising my kids, working, supporting them, four kids. and. Uh, and some of the influences in my life were set by then. Music was one. I had a degree in music. And uh, the work I did was always with scientists, so I've always had an interest in science. But I think it's when I met a Zen monk, who later became my, my teacher, Maizumi Roshi, at, later, that I sensed something I'd never sensed before. And I was about 48 then. and. Uh, began practicing, sort of, I thought I was anyway. And... Uh, what means sort of? Well, <laughs> a lot of people think they're practicing, you know, but they're not. <laughs> I, I'm sure I was one of those. So I really kept up with all those things I was doing. Music, men, <laughs> very important. My children, very important. Um, and my Zen practice uh, until I decided to retire a little bit early so I could go through all of Cohen's study. <clears throat> Moved to Los Angeles and uh, stayed at the Zen Center of Los Angeles for, I don't know how long it was, seven or eight years, maybe. It's a busy place, you know, with plenty of work to do. We worked a full eight-hour day, got up at four to sit every morning, and uh, um, sat every evening. We all uh, became monks, shaved our heads, and did all that stuff. And uh, crazy, huh? 
there's all this emphasis on great enlightenment experiences and uh, and yet the people who are teaching this were not very nice to each other I mean it was uh, there's a lot of really harmful stuff going on in other words whatever it is that might have been learned wasn't really being learned not completely it was sort of one-sided you might say so I began to sort of go another way. Let's say that as time went on, I got my own ideas as to what this was and what it wasn't, and uh, began to slowly drop out of traditional practice. So I began to try to figure things out, and it's a very slow process to work out another way of approaching this. Because what I do isn't psychology, but it certainly embraces uh, some therapeutic factors, you might say. Our lives consist of making lots of choices all the time. We can't avoid making choices. See? But the question is, on what basis do we make the choice? And practice is a lot about looking into that. We tend to feel that practice is about knowing everything, knowing absolutely how to make the best choice in any situation. That we should be able to do things perfectly. And we're very angry with ourselves when we can't be perfect. The point is, when there's an emotion pushing our life, is when we get into trouble. And we get into trouble as those negative experiences trigger the negative thoughts, and then I think I'm having them, and I'm bad, and you're bad, and and the fun begins. My partner hasn't spoken to me for a week, okay? Well, I have a thought about that, okay? I have a thought, well, what's the use of a relationship like this? It's too painful. I can't stand it. He's a miserable person. And oh, my Zen training. Well, I shouldn't be seeing all this. I should be doing something else. I shouldn't be thinking this, I mean. By the time you've done an hour or so of that, you're sunk, frankly. Your ship's gone down. <laughs> Is that funny, Kate? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's funny. <laughs> See, we sink our own ship, and then you think somebody else sank it. It's very funny. We're constantly sinking our own ship. Well, the sessions are really controlled suffering. Nobody admits that, but that's really what they are. In other words, human life gets off track because of our stubborn insistence that life be pleasant and the way I want it to. In session, you get a chance to face not monumental suffering, but suffering. And uh, if it's not physical, it's going to be mental from just sitting there so long. Not always, not all the time, but it's, uh, it's running in and out. And three days is valuable, five days is more valuable. I like five days, I think it's just about right. Some people like six, seven, but uh, for the way we work here, five is about right. There's something about the completely stripped away character of sitting where you're left with nothing except yourself. And even that has to be so quiet that you can't fool around. Uh, the resistance you can maintain in your daily life uh, and your daily sitting is hard to maintain when you sit that many hours a day. 
something begins to sort of give way. It's almost imperceptible, but it does happen. And that enables the student and the teacher to see more clearly where to work, for one thing. And uh, as you go through this little storms of session, there's a steady, steady calming out. Uh, things begin to settle. I call it a settling process. There are very few people at the end of five days who aren't considerably different from the way they start. And I think sessions are not absolutely essential. You can do it without sessions, but if you don't use sessions, then you need to know how to use the ordinary suffering of your life, and most people can avoid that very nicely. I would come home from work and I was just kind of disconnected, didn't know what to do. And so she had me, she did a sort of a version of um, Marita therapy. It's a traditional Japanese psychotherapy sort of thing where you, you, you focus down to minutia. She had me um, keep track of my time and my, my experience, my, what I was doing and what my experience of my body and my emotional state was every 15 minutes. I mean, it was it was incredible. I mean, I because I was just spinning off into this. I hate my life. I don't know what to do. I was paranoid. I, I was sure I was doing a bad job. I, I didn't have a boyfriend. I didn't want a boyfriend. I wanted a boyfriend. I mean, it was just this kind of, you know, I didn't. I hated Texas, or I didn't, but I didn't have any money. I mean, it was just this. Just, it was everything was just. Oh, you know? <laughs> so it's just kind of just. She just write it down to this, okay, every 15 minutes, write down, and then send it to one. She said, I want you to do it for a week, and then send it to me. Well, so after a few days, it just kind of, I, I remembered, oh yeah, I'm not breathing. <laughs> you know? Or I'm not, I'm, I would remember things like, I'm just, you know, oh yeah, I just can just do what I'm doing. I just, you know, take a breath, and just do the next thing that comes along, just answer the phone, see who's on the other side of it, you know, it's... <laughs> instead of this whole, like, drama, I have to solve my life, I have to, you know, figure out, you know, all that stuff. I mean, all that stuff that you do when you're, when you're, sp when you're spiraling, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, therapy... ...begins to sort of make clear some of the problems in which we're caught. But it's always trying to say there's you and then you have this problem and to some degree trying to mitigate the problem to some degree just by the understanding and it is useful but it's of limited usefulness because that's not yet going to really transform anything therapy tends to give relief and sitting gives freedom but it's as though the first part of sitting embraces that and then there's a turning in practice which is not what therapy's about People who really sit well don't need a therapist. I mean, if they really, really can begin to get that objective stance about themselves. But not everyone can do that. Not at all. And sometimes for those, if they don't have money to go to a therapist, I turn into a therapist. And I do therapy. I know how to do that. When I was working at University of California, San Diego here, I was like an administrator, big chemistry department. <clears throat> and uh, I had all sorts of people coming in to talk to me. They'd watch to see if my boss left the office for 10 minutes, <laughs> dart in, or they'd want to go down and get a cup of coffee. And uh, so I had all this mini teaching going on all the time. Didn't quite realize what it was, but was going on steadily over the years and I developed some skill doing that at first didn't know what I was doing but I slowly learned something then I began to see practice somehow mixed up with this even though I was doing a very traditional practice <clears throat> that's when I began to sense what well, how talking to people and practice how they related and uh, 
when I went to ZCLA, um, I don't think Roshi really wanted to make me a teacher. I was too radical. But there were usually lines of people lined up outside my apartment <laughs> trying to get in. So he couldn't fight the, you know, the state of things. He made me a teacher mostly because it was happening. And that's, I think, the way teachers really get made. People all want to be teachers, you know, I don't know why. But I say, well, people are following you around enough. That's the way you tell. your 80th birthday this year and you have still a full-time job and even more than a full-time job. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think for one thing I have a mind that doesn't give me any great amount of trouble. <clears throat> Most people are worn out by their own minds and uh, if your own mind doesn't do that it's a big plus. And I take good care of myself now. Plus I want to do it. I mean there's nothing more exciting I think in the world and to sense that transformation beginning in another human being, even if it's just the beginning, it's wonderful. It's never complete, not in any of us. It's, that's exciting. You know, the person that started me at all this when I was maybe, well, Brenda was about 14, so I must have been, again, about late 40 somewhere. My friend Shirley, but to watch her die was what really made practice real for me. Uh, it was wonderful. Shirley had eight children, and uh, she always sat in where the washer and dryer <laughs> were the only place she could get any quiet at all. So yeah, she was amazing. And the night she died, it was just pure radiance. I was wasn't sad at all. I just felt wonderful. Went down and walked the beach all night. Seeing that was great. Accidents, severe illness, uh, losing a job, death in the family—all those things are. Of course, in the human sense, uh, tragedies, but also useful. Uh, the sickness that I have that I was dealing with for that period of time and then again later is called dermatomyositis. It's an immune system disease that I got several years ago. But in 1991, I got a very acute occurrence of it where uh, I couldn't even, it was getting to a point where I couldn't swallow food anymore because what happens is my own immune system tells my body to attack itself. Mm -hmm. So my muscles were attacking my own muscles and I was just atrophying. I was very angry, I was uh, very depressed, I was everything, all the things that happen when a person gets sick. And so I didn't even know what practice was. All I wanted was to get better and to not be sick anymore and not be miserable. I had gone to a sashin with Joko a year before that and had a very brief contact with her. Mainly she tried to help me with my marital difficulties. And so I called her up out of the blue one day. This was after around two months of being sick and wallowing in my unnecessary suffering. And she said something to me. I still remember the words, so I'm going to tell you what she said. She said, Ezra, I know that you, know, you don't want to hear this. I know this is very unpleasant and that you don't like this, but you have to realize that your illness is your path. And that's all she said to me. And she was also very compassionate in her, in her saying it to me. And something happened when she said it to me where my whole understanding of what was going on turned upside down. Mm -hmm. Actually, it turned right side up because I was upside down before that. And I really think now, in retrospect, thinking about it, that it really is like one of the most fundamental things that Joko has taught to me, that it may be in other teachings as well, but I didn't get it anywhere else as well. I mean, I know in Zen they always say that it's, it's our life, everything is our life, but when it really comes down to it, when you talk to Zen teachers, they really do separate sitting on the cushion as being really it from all the other stuff which they call makio or illusion, delusion. And so for me, what it meant was working with this anger that I had, like why is this happening to me that I'm sick? Or working with the self-pity, like poor me, and working with the fear, of, oh, what's going to happen to me in the future? Am I ever going to be a person again? All of these things were what was consuming me. 
And then from what Joko told me, and then consequently rereading her book, I understood that this is what I had to work with. This was my path because this was my sickness. In a way, in a way I want to just say this, it wasn't even so much that my body was sick. My body was sick. I mean, it was very sick. But the real thing that I had to work with was all this other stuff that was getting me in the way from even experiencing what the physical sickness was. I do flown hours for eight hours a week. I have a lot of um, things that just happen. People come through and you talk to them and do things like that. And I have all the uh, ordinary things to do. Cooking, shopping, and I do my Pilates. I probably spend about an hour a day on exercise. Really? Yeah, because I have to. If I don't, I won't do anything else. What has some of the elements of yoga, mm -hmm. Alexander technique, uh, develops strength, flexibility, balance, um, and it's all mental. I mean, it's, <clears throat> really? if you can't do it in your mind, you can't do it. So it's a, it doesn't look like that much, but once you do it, it gets a grip on you. In the beginning, you just don't have the muscle to do it. Uh, but as you get stronger, of course, what they have you do gets harder. So. I'm still just a beginner, and at my age, probably never will be much more than that, but it uh, doesn't matter. In the traditional way of teaching Zen, called Shikantaza, which is simply to sit, that's what it means, just sitting, um, there's not the emphasis on relating the physical experience to the mental monkey shines. It's when they come together that the personality and the person begin to integrate. Um, you can sit in a very clear awareness without having any awareness of yourself and the sort of things you really would like to think about. So it's when you have denied nothing, let it all sit in there, it comes together. And that seems to be the maturing factor in sitting. Not forever. Eventually that becomes very easy. But until you've done that, the next layer of sitting can't show up. It's just until you're largely free of your personal um, ambition, you might say, for your own life to go well, or for your children's life to go well, or all that stuff we think we have to do is, uh, stands in the way. <clears throat> That doesn't mean you don't take good care of your children, but you don't have a life as an ambitious project. First I was very angry. How come you're not paying more attention to this opening that I had, to this experience? And I want to talk about it more. And uh, I mean, she, she talked about it a little bit. She. She wasn't curt, but she, that's not where the emphasis was. And it took me years to really understand deeply inside what her practice is about. A lot of practice tries to leap over this long development uh, that is very necessary and try to talk about Kensho and these breakthroughs and the world is one. It's as though you skipped first grade through high school and then try to go to graduate school. You can't do that. So we have to go, we have to really go through ourselves to study uh, Zen, to study yourself, you know, Dogen Zenji. And uh, to study the self is, in time, to forget the self. So, and to forget the self is to be enlightened by all things. Enlightenment is just a basic change in the way you are. And uh, just to have an experience for a second where things come together in a certain way and click, you see something, until that can pervade your life, it's not that valuable, you know. It's just not. People like that can swindle other people and they can do all sorts of things. They're not apt to, but I'm saying that I think there's an illusion that 
you have an enlightenment experience, so-called, seeing the nature of reality, uh, that you're going to be forever different. They last about an hour, is my experience. It doesn't mean you forget it, and it has that influence. You see, it's a checking point that forever after you know things are not quite the way you're trying to think they are. It's in love. <laughs> Is that funny? <laughs> For me, there's no difference now during session and outside of session, but it took 25 years before that was true. I was always a little clearer after session than, say, from three weeks later. Um, but now it stays just calm. Uh, but that's just lots of things that you're learning, intellectually, uh, kinesthetically. Uh, uh, it's much like a sport, but it's harder than a sport because your whole central project shifts from being yourself to being life itself. And no sport is quite as extreme in that uh, respect. Uh, athletes fall into what they call the zone once in a while, like Stampers was obviously in it today. Um, and he knows what that is, but I don't think he could just be that, you see what I mean? That's for some reason when everything is clicking and he forgets himself, then he plays beautifully. Which is what life should be. The real Zen is just being aware of what's going on. Because that teaches everything. Huh? It's a good quote, but of course it would be even nicer if I got it right and I don't know it. Something like, um, it's something like, stop thinking, stop dreaming, and there's nothing you will not know. See, that's a simple statement. Stop thinking. That means self-centered thinking, of course. Stop thinking, stop dreaming, and there's nothing you will not know. Okay, good enough. Okay. Okay. Without closing your door. Without closing your door. You can just walk out. I just matter. Just walk for sure. Are you doing that? <laughs>